It's a really a pleasure to be here uh, to talk on behalf of the Extended uh, Oligo Archive Consortium. Uh, I'm Raja Puswami. I'm an assistant professor in the data science department at uh, Uricom. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Uricom, uh, it's, a, it's a research institute. We call it it's a Grand École in the south of France. So I'm about 30 minutes away from Cannes, where the film festival happens, which unfortunately has been canceled this year, just like many other events uh, due to the, the COVID-19 situation. Um, but hopefully in the future, you know, if any of you find the talk inspiring and you you are around the region in person, I would, you know, be more than happy to have you over at Uricom and, you know, host you at Uricom. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. Okay. So uh, before I actually ta start talking about DNA and about how, po why we want to store Postgres on DNA, I sort of want to give you uh, a background context to this whole problem. Why did we start looking at this problem? And this actually has to do with the growth of archival data. So many of you in the audience, because you're all folks who are working on databases, who are dealing with data on a daily basis, you're all familiar with the fact that we are all gathering data at an alarming rate. Enterprises, especially with the growth of our, the, the, the rising popularity of machine learning and AI, everybody wants data, right? So data is kind of the new oil and it's been, you know, many people have given it many other metaphors for data. But essentially, there are predictions, projections from um, IDC and a few other uh, companies where, which actually say that the total amount of data, the global data sphere that we all generate, uh, is going to be more than 200 zettabytes. So this number has been refined here and there, but it's about 175 to 200 zettabytes by the time we reach 2025. Okay, and 50% of that data is actually going to be enterprise data. Uh, am I still audible? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So uh, in case, you know, just uh, if you guys have any questions and you want to interrupt me at any point, please feel free to do so. Okay, so basically 50% of the data that's going to be generated uh, is going to be enterprise data. And, and um, interestingly, as you can all imagine, not all this data is frequently accessed. Quite often when we talk about databases or when we talk about analytics, or perhaps like, you know, Amazon Aurora, when the guys give you a talk, we are all always talking about data that's, uh, that, that requires instant access, that requires high performance, right? Fast transactions, whatever we needed. We never tend to think about data that's not accessed that much. And what's perhaps surprising is the fact that 80% of the data that enterprises are generating is actually cold, meaning it's actually infrequently accessed or it's rarely accessed. Okay, so only 20% of your data is accessed routinely daily on a regular basis. And this cold data is the one that's actually increasing rapidly. So uh, recent studies from Horizon uh, put it at around a 60% cumulative annual growth rate. So year over year, this cold data is actually increasing at a rapid pace. Right? If you look at the traditional storage hierarchy that we have used over the last you know, two, three decades, it sort of looks something like this, right? So on the x-axis, you have the access latency of various devices. On the y-axis, you have the cost of various devices. And today, if you go to enterprises, typically we use a three-tier storage hierarchy. So we have the performance tier, the capacity tier, and the archival tier. In the performance tier, we actually have devices like DRAM and SSDs, which are based on NAND flash, today, which is very, very popular. Now, these devices are the ones that are typically used for storing high performance data, data that for which you need fast and real time access, right? And as you might expect, these devices, the latency of these devices is in the nanosecond or microsecond range. So they are very, very quick. In the capacity tier, the device that dominates the capacity tier is the venerable hard disk drive. For over 30, 30 40 years, we have had hard disk drives we have had improve, phenomenal improvements in the in the density of hard disk drives. And today you can easily get a hard disk drive which can store about one to 10 terabytes of data, right? So the capacity tier where you don't need, where you have data that's accessed relatively frequently, but you don't need high performance access to the data. That's the tier that's dominated by hard disk drive. And the access latency here is in the millisecond range. Then finally, you have your archival tier which is data that you're going to store away, you're going to move away, you're not going to look at it 
very frequently at all. It's rarely accessed. And there, the dominating device is going to be tape. Now, when I say tape, many people find it surprising, perhaps not this audience, but a lot of people find it surprising that tape is still one of the leading storage devices out there. And, and this is the case. It, it turns out that the long-term archival storage is a, is a billion-dollar industry that is heavily dominated by tape. Right? And if you look at the access latencies of tape, it's usually in the minutes range. right? So if you want to get data back from tape, the first time to accessing the first byte of data from tape is usually a few minutes before you can get it back. So today, the, the takeaway point here uh, that I want, want you to take away from the slide is that what we are interested in for today's talk is not the high performance data. Okay, So we are going to look at the other side of the spectrum, which is the coal data that, that's growing extremely fast. And today, if you want to store coal data, the cheapest way of storing coal data without any doubt is tape. And this is also the reason why most archives, whether it's uh, scientific archives, whether it's uh, enterprise archives, if there is a talk about archival, usually tape is involved in the story one way or the other. So tape is great, right? So why am I talking about tape here so much? Tape, over the last few years, we have actually started seeing problems emerging with tape. Now, in order to see the problems, we need to look at a few other trends, okay? So the first trend is, given that a large amount of data is cold, and given that cold data is increasing, an obvious question to ask is, if I want to keep this cold data for a long time, what's the time frame that I'm looking at, right? So do I want to store it for one year? Do I want to store it for 10 years? What's the time frame? So the, the SNEA, or the Storage and Networking Industry Association, uh, it's an organization um, of companies and of research institutes and you know various other academic institutes also that they did a study about the the lifetime of data or about the long-term data requirements of enterprises and uh, uh, you know museums and archives and a whole bunch of other uh, institutes and what they actually found uh, what's shown in the pie chart here is the distribution of you know what percentage of participants in the survey what's the time frame that they needed to keep the data for, right? For instance, if you look at the, a part of the pie chart, which says seven to 10 years, about 20% of the participants said they need to keep data for that particular time frame, right? So the key takeaway from this, again, if you note here, is, is that about more than 60% of the participants in this study actually said they need to store data longer than 20 years. There were participants who actually said that some data that they had needed to be preserved for over 100 years, right? And as you can imagine, this could be archives, for instance, or national museums, libraries, who need to preserve data for a very long time. But you also had many participants who actually wanted to preserve data, for instance, 21 to 50 years, you had 20% of the participants, 50 to 100 years, you had another 10%, right? So these are companies, in many cases, these are companies who actually have legal liability who actually have um, who have to protect who have to protect the data and safeguard the data for meeting various regulatory compliance requirements like sarbanes oxley or uh, many other many other requirements which keep popping up now that you know data privacy and data security and data protection is a big issue right and especially given the fact that today data is used for driving machine learning based decisions it's extremely important for companies to keep the data around because 20 years later, if somebody comes back to sue the company, they better have a reproducible pipeline that says how they made that decision, right? So it's increasingly becoming even more important to keep data for very long time frames. So the first problem here, as soon as we start talking about keeping data longer than 20 years, we hit the first problem with tape, which is the fact that tape is actually built for a lifetime of about 10 to 20 years, not longer than that, okay? And the situation for other devices like hard disks or solid state storage is even worse. So these devices, the lifetime of these devices, never, you know, rarely exceeds 10 years. It's not that these devices are not capable of lasting longer, it's just that these device manufacturers have no incentive to manufacture devices that can last long. So it's, it's similar to the story where, uh, the typical story is that they know that most people are going to replace their disk drives within the next five years or so, or within the next seven years or so as a part of their routine refresh. And so they keep, they manufacture disk drives that can last only for that long, right? But 
in general what uh, what's important here is that the lifetime of these devices whether it's disk or tape is kind of bound and it's kind of limited whereas we as a society the enterprises uh, and industries need to keep data for much much longer the second problem which you know when i talk when i talk about this would not appear as a problem is what uh, what has to do with something that's referred to as the crider's rate so um, mark crider actually uh, had this particular rate similar to the moore's law where he said that the storage density of hard disk drives actually uh, you know doubles almost nearly uh, doubles on on an annual basis right so the density of hard disk drives improves pretty rapidly and this actually used to be the case uh, for quite a long time uh, up until recently when uh, we started facing issues with scaling the magnetic density of hard disk drives so what i am showing you in the figure here is actually density improvements the aerial density improvements of various devices so the red line shows you the density improvements for hard disk drives the green line shows you the density improvements for nand flash and the blue line is for tape so what you see here is traditionally the red line hard disk drive line used to go up uh, the density improvements uh, used to be 25% per year uh, it actually used to be more like 40% per year uh, but now it's we are at a point where we are plateauing and we are reaching only about 10 to 15% per year improvement in hard disk density the green line that shows you the density improvements in nand flash are much more promising so nand flash because of the fact that you can stack uh, nand flash um, you know vertically and we are actually seeing 3d nand these days you get much higher volumetric density and the density of nand flash is improving about 30 33% per year and if you look at the tape drives and if you average out the density improvements you also see the tape is improving at around 30% per year density so you might think that this is good news right so we have storage devices particularly tape here which is improving at 30% per year and so this is good news because you know uh, the technology is evolving which means we will be able to store more data in the future so that's what you would normally think but the problem here is a much more insidious one the the problem is the fact that if technology evolves at 30% per year within the next 3 to 5 years your tape capacity is going to improve so much that you can actually store the same amount of data that you have today with half the tape disk drives within the next 5 years okay so if you are using 100 tape drives to store data today within the next 5 years you will be able to use just 50 tape drives now this is a problem because if you are going to use fewer drives to store the data given that storage space is a premium commodity in the data center the incentive to migrate data is very very high so you want to move data from one generation of tape to the next generation of tape so that you can pack more data together in fewer containers right and this in essence is the problem the problem is that this triggers a continuous data migration cycle when every generation new generation of tape comes out the density goes up you are forced to migrate from the previous generation to the new generation right not because the vendors are forcing you but because you know that it's going to be you know it's going to be cheaper to store fewer hard disk drives now or fewer tape drives now right so what's going to happen is very quickly the cost of storing data is going to be dominated by the cost of migrating data from one generation of tape to the next okay and this problem has already hit the hollywood so a couple of years ago there was this uh, very interesting article by marty permutter where he talks about how hollywood archivists are actually having problems archiving a lot of movies uh, on tape drives so once again the core issue there was the fact that nowadays we are shooting movies at very very high uh, uh, we, we are shooting we are shooting 4k movies we are actually shooting movies at a 200 is to 1 rate meaning uh, we are shooting way more than what we actually keep finally in the movie so editors clip out a lot of stuff right and, and for posterity if we want to keep all of these videos if we want to keep everything that we shoot the amount of storage capacity that you need per movie is absolutely staggering the problem starts when you need to preserve these movies over the next 50 years or 100 years you know god forbid if someone 50 years later is not going to be able to watch a favorite pixar movie from today right that's that's simply unacceptable so uh, the problem is you want to keep these movies 
we are shooting movies at uh, better definition, better quality, and you want to keep these movies. And the only way to do this today, the cheapest way to do this today, is to use tape drives for storing all the movies and periodically migrate from one generation of tape to the next generation. And this migration, if you look at it from a terabyte or a petabyte point of view, is an extremely expensive endeavor. And Hollywood archives have very, very little limited resource budget, right, which they have to use for preserving these movies. And all of these, all of this budget is basically being used in this migration process, or a majority of it is being used, right? There is also the associated problem that when you go from one generation of tape to another generation, the technology that's used for reading the tape itself, right? LTO keeps compatibility only up to two or three generations, uh, you know, backwards compatibility, which means that if you have an LTO uh, tape today and you want to access it 15 years later using the latest tape reading technology, chances are very likely you're not going to be able to do. Okay, this was another reason, another motivating factor for Hollywood archives and for archives in general to migrate the data from one generation of tape to the next. So the article actually says, uh, you know, it, it reads to, to just read an excerpt from the article. It says that there is going to be a large dead period from late 90s to 2020, where a lot of media that's actually generated is going to be lost. So a lot of independent independent movies that are produced are not going to be, um, you know, archived at all. Right. And, and what we are predicting, putting all of this together, the fact that you are get, storing more data, the fact that most of your data is cold, cold data is growing at an alarming rate. You need to preserve this cold data for various legal implications or for various uh, regulatory compliance requirements. And the only way to do this today is on tape. If you put all of this together, it's very, very obvious that enterprises and databases are actually going along the same trajectory they are going to reach the same path which Hollywood archives have already reached today. So very near, in the near future, we are going to face a problem. We are going to face the question, what should I archive and what should I not archive, right? And that's going to become a major problem in enterprises if it is already not a problem. So this problem, this obsolescence problem is what made us actually think about, uh, you know, the fact that we need something different. We need a new media technology something that will help us solve this problem, take a first step towards solving this problem. And DNA, you know, it, it has a long legacy. Several years ago, um, people have actually talked about using DNA as a digital storage medium. Now, a very quick uh, biology 101 for those of you who don't know about DNA. DNA is a macromolecule. I'm talking about pretty much the same DNA that is responsible that carries the genetic code inside the human body. So this is a macromolecule that's composed of four uh, sub-molecules. These are called nucleotides. You have adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. These are the four nucleotides. And these nucleotides are actually strung up uh, you know, with each other to form a longer chain of nucleotides that is referred to as an oligo. A short sequence of nucleotides is an oligo, and a DNA is nothing but a longer stretch of these nucleotides. Right? Now, the naturally occurring DNA in human bodies is a, is a double-stranded DNA. You have two strands of nucleotides. Um, but in practice, in when we talk about digital storage, most of the time we are actually talking about single-stranded DNA, just one strand of these nucleotides. So as I said, uh, several people, several researchers, perhaps as early as 1970s, have actually talked about storing information on DNA. The fact that DNA carries genetic information you know, that, that's passed down from one generation to the next is an obvious giveaway that it can actually be a medium for storing digital information. So the general cycle goes something like this. You take binary data, uh, which I have represented in the middle on top. You take data from any file, uh, take the binary data. Then you run it through an encoding procedure that's responsible for converting the binary data into a sequence of nucleotides. And this sequence is essentially your uh, DNA. Uh, then you synthesize the DNA. So these are strings. So you're converting binary data into these strings. Then you synthesize it actually. So synthesis is actually a biochemical reaction where you are manufacturing, synthesizing this DNA as the name implies. Um, now we are, this synthesis is not happening inside the body, as you can imagine, this is happening outside, right? So this is a controlled biochemical reaction that's done by several companies today. Um, and once the DNA is synthesized, you get your data stored on the DNA. Uh, 
which you then send through uh, when you want to read the data back, you apply a procedure called sequencing, which is a molecular biology technique. This is the standard procedure used for reading a human's DNA. It's exactly the same procedure we use, we use for reading synthetic DNA, which stores digital data. Okay. And when you sequence the DNA, what you get back is a set of strings again, similar to the fact that we encode binary data into strings. You are sequencing the DNA back and you get a set of strings. Now, these strings do not match the original strings. Okay. They are not going to be an exact representation of the original strings because the procedure of synthesizing DNA and sequencing DNA is error prone. So both these biochemical and molecular biology steps, they are going to inject a lot of errors in the data that you actually stored on your DNA. So the DNA is going to, that gets that gets read out is going to be different from what you actually synthesized. Okay. And it's your job, it's the decoder's job to then figure out from this jumble of strings that you get to figure out what the original set of strings is and from the original strings to go back to the original data. So this is kind of, uh, I've, give, I've given you an overview of how, you know, the uh, data moves from being binary into being a, a DNA form in, back into the binary form. So these are the steps that are actually involved. So this is your biology 101 and what you need to know about uh, storing data on DNA, right? And this is what, this has been proposed long back, um, you know, uh, about storing data on DNA and quite a few uh, people have actually proposed several schemes for encoding data on DNA and for decoding data on DNA. Before we look at, you know, the specific way in which we actually encode data or specific way of, you know, how do you go about doing this encoding or decoding? We need to now ask the question, why DNA at all, right? So why are we talking about DNA? There are several advantages in using DNA as a digital storage media. The first thing is that it's, it's incredibly dense. Okay? So the figure here uh, is taken from the Semiconductor and Synthetic Biology uh, Consortium's roadmap. And what it shows is the, the density, the, the volumetric information density of various storage devices that we have available today, the ones that I talked about a few minutes ago, and DNA. And potentially, this is the theoretical density uh, that's you can potentially achieve with DNA, right? So you could, you can, you're looking at, uh, you know, upwards of an exabyte per cubic millimeter when you store data on DNA, and it's about seven to eight orders of magnitude more dense than any storage media that we have available today. So this is the very first reason why we want to look at DNA because it's an incredibly dense uh, three-dimensional storage medium that's way more dense than anything we have available today and it will remain for a very, very long time in the future. The second reason is that DNA is extremely durable. So some of you might be aware that there was a recent experiment uh, from uh, Professor George Church at Harvard and his team where they tried to actually um, essentially bring back the woolly mammoth to life. So woolly mammoth is an extinct species um, that that the last remains of which was found in Siberia, if I'm not wrong, in the permafrost fossils about 5,000 years ago. So there were researchers who actually physically went, extracted the fossils, extracted a bit of DNA from the fossils, and they tried to use gene editing technology with elephants to see if they could bring back the woolly mammoth, you know, back to life. Right now, the point of the story to to take away from here is even in such harsh environments where the DNA is absolutely not protected whatsoever in a fossil, right? And there's no special protection mechanisms. The researchers were able to uncover some bits and pieces. Now, uh, it's important to note that uh, if we protect the DNA, when I say protect, I mean, uh, if DNA is stored in proper environmental conditions, it has the potential to last for several thousands of years uh, very easily. We are working in collaboration with a company here, Imagine, which is also, which manufactures DNA shells, which are these tiny, uh, tiny stainless steel containers, which have a sealed vacuum, um, a vacuumed glass uh, container inside the stainless steel containers. And when you store the DNA in these containers, on in room temperature, you can store the sealed DNA for several thousands of years without any problem. So you don't even need any special climatic conditions for storing DNA. So it's incredibly durable as a storage medium. The third and perhaps one of the most intriguing aspects, one of the most interesting aspects is the fact that DNA's uh, density is fixed, right? The biological density of these 
nucleotides that we are talking about is completely fixed by nature. We are not going to change it. Within three years or five years, we are not going to come up with a new DNA that's going to be 33% more dense than the DNA that we have today. Okay, so the Kreider's rate of DNA in theory is actually zero, which basically means the DNA completely obliviates the need for any kind of migration. So these are the some of the main reasons why we actually want to actually why we want to focus on using DNA as a digital storage medium. There are a few other reasons, um, uh, you know, things, uh, for instance, that has to do with uh, you could compare, um, you know, the the, the ability uh, to store data using silicon based technologies versus uh, biological technologies. There are a few other reasons why you might want to go, but centrally, you know, there are, we have many, many good reasons to investigate DNA as a good storage medium. And given that that's the case, the question that we, we asked in this project uh, is how can we use DNA then as an archival media for relational databases, right? Now, the reason to focus on relational databases, if you rethink back to my first slide, is that 50% of data that's generated by 2025 will be enterprise data. And enterprise data has this characteristic feature that a vast majority of it is structured, right? So we have, we, we have a huge amount of enterprise data sitting in databases, data warehouses, data lakes, however you want to call them. Uh, and these, there is some inherent structure in the data, right, that you can potentially exploit to improve the density of DNA storage or to pull down the cost of synthesizing DNA storage uh, or for various other purposes, some of which you will see in this talk. So Project Oligo Archive uh, is the initiative um, that we started to investigate uh, uh, using DNA as an archival media for databases, particularly uh, Postgres, you will see later in this talk. Uh, it's a European Commission funded future and emerging technologies initiative. Uh, very, very happy to be supported by the EEC uh, on this project. And we are working uh, as a consortium, as a, as a group of six partners across three countries. And this is truly really an interdisciplinary research agenda that's looking across multiple disciplines. Just to give you an idea of the different kinds of you know, topics that kind of come up, right? So we have a group of computer scientists who are working on efficiently encoding uh, data on DNA. So the steps in the four steps that I told you about how data goes through, like, you know, binary data goes through uh, from its digital form into being a DNA, into being synthesized to sequence. So we have computer scientists looking at efficient encoding and decoding algorithms, pooling in uh, concepts from information theory and machine learning. We have molecular biologists who are actually working on accelerating sequencing uh, for reading data back from DNA and who are working also on near molecule data, molecular data analysis uh, for content detection. So one of the things I will talk about, I'll touch on briefly later in the talk, is that once you store data on DNA, not only can you store data, but you could potentially use DNA as a processing medium. This is pushing the envelope even further, right? So we are now uh, already in, in this generation, we are actually talking about um, smart devices. We are talking about uh, smart SSDs, which actually have inbuilt processing capability that you can offload computation from your CPUs to the device. I'm here to, to tell you that we have actually, uh, we are experimenting with the idea of what we are calling near molecule query processing, where we are pushing computation close to the data so that you can run some selections and projections, for example, on right there uh, on data sitting in the DNA using biochemical reactions rather than having to pull the data out and run it in the CPU. Okay, so this is one of the aspects of our uh, work. Uh, we also have uh, people working in biochemistry. In particular, we have a startup from uh, Ireland, Helixworks, who's, who is focusing on um, synthesizing DNA, who is focusing on novel enzymatic techniques for manufacturing, for synthesizing DNA to bring down the cost. And finally, we have some experts in robotics and micro, microfluidics in Imperial College who are working on uh, uh, you know, how to automate this end-to-end -end procedure of writing data and reading data from DNA without any kind of intermediate person you know, uh, sitting in a lab doing wet lab work where he, is, he or she is pipetting out data from you know, test tubes and using it, you know, adding, it uh, adding reagents to it and running the experiments, right? So how do you automate the whole thing? So just to give you an idea that like we have, this is a truly interdisciplinary research agenda that spans many different topics. So the, the goal of this project is to actually build a custom storage stack 
for data archival on DNA. And when I mean a custom stack, we are going to look uh, at, we want to actually start thinking of DNA as pretty much any other storage device. Right? We want to st start thinking of DNA like tape, for instance. If you look at tape, there is starting from the bottom, there is a media layer, which is responsible for actually how the data ultimately gets encoded as those magnetic particles on your tape, for instance. right? So in DNA, we actually want to look at this part as uh, how does the DNA actually get synthesized for writing data and how does it get sequenced for reading data? So that's the media layer. The next layer, the controller layer, is what I just talked about, which is how do you offload processing to the DNA? What kind of processing can you run on the DNA? What kind of selections are, you know, and how do you actually do this? What are the biochemical reactions that you can do it? So that's the controller layer. On top of that, we have the operating system layer. So if you are familiar with tape, you probably know that there is a standard LTO and there is a file system called linear tape file system, LTFS, that allows you to view tape like a file system, just like any other network attached storage system. And you can drag and drop files from wherever, whichever directories you want. You have to a directory that's stored on tape and you, the only thing you probably will notice is the latency. Other than that, it provides a nice unified uh, interface to take. We want a similar interface to DNA storage. We do not want to be. We do not want our users to actually have to do anything with, uh, you know, either writing strings of nucleotides or doing the, you know, the procedure of encoding and decoding. None of that should be exposed to the users our user in this particular case being Postgres, right? So the Postgres database should be comfortable in working with these kind of abstractions. And these abstractions are also useful because they help you uh, to sort of selectively retrieve some data from the DNA. For instance, if you want to do a, a point in time restore, when you actually want to restore your database to a specific point, you want to selectively retrieve only portions of the database. How would you do that with DNA? So that's the part of the OS layer that we are looking at. Then you have finally the application layer, which is going to be responsible for how do you take, how do you go from tuples that are stored in a database? How do you go from relations, primary keys, foreign keys? Um, how do you go from the structured data you have in Postgres into a representation on DNA, which is a sequence of nucleotides, right? So that's going to be the application layer. So we're looking at both databases in the context of the project. We are looking at both databases, which is structured data and unstructured data like images and videos. So today we will just, I'll just give you an overview of the database work or the structured work. So I won't touch on the unstructured work. So having talked about uh, the, the architect, having talked about, uh, sorry, the layers in the DNA storage, what we sort of envision, how we sort of envision the whole architecture playing out is shown in this diagram. So what you see on the right is the, the DNA storage system, which I talked about in the previous slide, right? So the DNA storage system is essentially this black box that you will, you will not see anything that's inside of it. Uh, there is going to be a DNA synthesizer, a, machine, a, a machinery that can manufacture or that can produce actual DNA. There is going to be a PCR thermocycler. We, we will talk about PCR a little bit later in this, uh, in this, in this slide deck. And there is going to be a DNA sequencer. So together, these three components are going to be responsible for essentially the, the media layer. So these are the ones that are responsible for reading and writing data back from DNA. Then internal inside this machine is going to be a library of uh, DNA uh, pods. So there are going to be several containers that are actually going to store physical DNA. Okay, And outside this unit, outside the DNA storage system, you do not have any kind of interaction with, uh, at, with the physical level, right? So you do not you do not communicate with this device in terms of uh, physical uh, DNA or anything. You communicate with it in terms of a familiar get put interface. Okay, so the idea here is that you have a database here, the Postgres database that's storing some tables. So here in this case, I'm, I'm taking the example of just one table where you have two records. You are going to use uh, two tools, PG Oligo Archive and PG Oligo Restore. So these are very similar to your PG Dump and PG Restore. Okay, so which are used for generating an archive or generating a dump of your database, which you can then go ahead and archive. So this tool is different in the sense that it's going to, instead of generating um, a, a SQL dump or a, a binary dump or a directory dump, which are the format supported by PG dump, it's going to generate essentially a dump, which is uh, um, a sequence of oligos that need to be synthesized, okay? a sequence of DNA strands that need to be synthesized. So what I'm showing you here is there are two records in this table. 
and each record will actually get mapped to one of the DNA strands. So just to give you an example, right? And once you have the DNA string here, these strings will be sent to the DNA storage subsystem with the put command, and the storage system will synthesize, actually make the DNA corresponding to these strings and store them in the library. At a later time, when you need the data back, you're going to do a get on the DNA, uh, for, uh, you know, to the DNA st storage subsystem. And the DNA subsystem is then going to read the data back from the DNA and return back a set of strings once again. It's very similar to what we saw in the beginning, but now I am putting it in context uh, with our DNA storage device and the database, okay? So it's up to PG Oligo Restore. So while traditional PG Restore gets this nice, beautiful, SQL dump or nice beautiful binary dump, which is completely error free. You don't have to worry about it. What we get uh, in PG Oligo Restore is uh, a collection of strings that uh, some way represent your original data. So the PG Oligo Restore now has to use whatever technique it uses for decoding this data and bringing back the original strings and then loading that, converting that back into the database and loading it into the database. So this is the, the overall architecture that we are sort of envisioning okay and in the in the rest of this talk uh, what i'll do is i'll give you like a high level overview of the internals of pg oligo archive and pg oligo restore so I'm, I'm just going to tell you at a high level what we do in these two tools and why uh, ha being you know using structuring information right using information about the database itself can be uh, can be something that's very useful uh, in optimizing the storage density when it comes to dna storage Okay, so let's start talking about the PG Oligo archive. The traditional way to encode data, to store data on DNA is to treat data as a binary stream. This is the example that I gave in the beginning. You start from a binary stream. That's how people always look at it, right? The encoding procedure, as I told you in the beginning, has to, has to deal with the fact that generating the DNA string, generating the DNA itself, and reading the DNA using sequencing. So synthesis and sequencing, these are error prone. Okay? These are not 100% accurate uh, uh, you know, biological uh, steps. So these are going to inject errors in, your, in the data that you're going to store on the DNA. On top of that, we have many, many limitations which are driven by the biological limitations of these uh, steps. And DNA cannot be of an infinite length. Okay? So you cannot manufacture a DNA if you look at, if you remember what I said about the DNA, it's a sequence of these nucleotides, A, C, G, and T. You cannot manufacture a DNA that has 1 million nucleotides in it, one DNA with 1 million nucleotides, okay? This is a limitation of today's synthesis technology that the maximum you can manufacture, the maximum length of DNA, a single DNA strand you can manufacture is in, in the order of a few hundreds or a few thousand nucleotides at best, that's it. So you cannot go more than a few hundred nucleotides or a few thousand nucleotides. Okay. Second, you cannot have a string where you have multiple, a single nucleotide repeating more than a few times. So you cannot have a string that reads like A, 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 T, C. No, that's sequence of four or five nucleotides. You cannot have it in a string because when this, uh, this has something to do with the fact that when you try to read this data back from the DNA, the sequencing step will actually have many issues if you have these homopolymer repeats. And the synthesis, synthesis step, which is manufacturing the DNA, will also run into chemical limitations if you have these homopolymer repeats. So without going into the details, you cannot have these repeats. Okay. And the third thing is the fact that you, your, the percentage of Gs and Cs in your DNA to As and Ts, it needs to be controlled. You cannot have widely varying ratios of Gcs and Ats. Okay. There are uh, biological and thermodynamic limitations that actually limit what you can do. And finally, as I said, the synthesis and sequencing procedures can introduce errors. So imagine the DNA that you manufactured is ATCG. A, you might get back, when you read the data back, you might get back, instead of ATCG, you could get back AACG. Or you could get back an ATTCG. It could be one insertion. Or you could get back ACG. One of the nucleotides could be deleted, right? So your encoding procedure, as you can imagine, has to deal with all of these errors has to deal with all of these limitations in converting data from whether it's a binary stream, whether it's a structured stream into um, you know, a sequence of strings. So the traditional approach, given the number of problems associated with just this encoding, the traditional approach, uh, pe pe what people have done uh, before us 
is they have been looking at uh, you know focusing on one problem at a time let's look at a binary stream and let's figure out what's the best way to convert a binary stream into a string of dna strands so that all of these issues can be dealt with right so that's the focus so if we follow that approach the idea of what we can do is of course we can take a database we can dump it out uh, using pg dump for example right and we can treat that as a binary file so as i have shown you here you have your pg archive or pg dump that takes the database and it's going to dump out an archive file and you treat that as a binary you really don't care what's inside that then you feed it in through an encoder that other people have built for dealing with binary streams okay and this encoder is going to spit out a bunch of dna strands and these dna strands are actually uh, they are they are encoded in such a way that there is error correcting information built into the strands uh, there there are uh, the algorithms they use make sure that homopolymer repeats don't happen the gc content is fine the dna strands are limited in length to a particular uh, you know to 150 or 250 or 350 nucleotides so th that's controllable so the encoder deals with all of this so this is what you know this is um, the encoder's job to make sure that all of these restrictions are held and you have these dna strands which you can then send to a company out for synthesizing okay so you a company can manufacture these dna strands and you get back the actual dna so this is the traditional step now very quickly the very first problem comes up the problem is as i told you and as it's evident from this example a single database file a binary file is going to be broken up across multiple dna strands this is because each dna strand is only going to be let's say uh, 100 nucleotides long right and if you look at the the information density of dna i told you each that uh, there are four nucleotides in each position right you can have a, a c t or a g this means this is a quaternary code and a quaternary code at best can actually store two bits per nucleotide so you can actually say 0 0 is an a 0 1 is a t 1 1 0 is a c and 1 1 is a g so you can store two bits per nucleotide so that's the the density that you can actually store at best right because of the fact that you have only 100 nucleotides in one strand you are looking at about 200 bits per strand 200 bits per strand means that if you actually have a 1 kilobyte uh, database you need five strands for storing it right or a 1 megabyte database you need 5000 strands or a 1 gigabyte database 5 million strands so you are looking at storing a single gigabyte database across millions of dna strands now here comes the problem the dna strands are not at uh, are, they have no kind of addressing when you write data to a file when a database writes data to a file you use a nice offset that's provided by your os you can actually say i want to read from offset 100 i want to read from offset 200 dna does not provide you offsets okay so it's up to you to actually index the data in your dna and the way you do that is you actually add a unique offset to each dna strand so now each dna strand is not only going to store the data but it's going to store an offset and this the length of this offset obviously is going to be dictated by the number of dna strands that you are going to generate right and what you will see is if you are storing a terabyte of data about 17 nucleotides or 20 nucleotides out of 150 nucleotides are going to be reserved for just storing your indexing information right and that's that's a quite quite large fraction right so substantial portion of your data more than 10% of your data of your uh, dna is actually going to be used for just indexing information the associated problem which other people didn't look at because they didn't focus on databases which we did is that you cannot do near molecule data processing and this we'll come back to this in a in a later slide so what we did is we actually look that how can we actually exploit the structure of the database the information that we have in the database the schema to drive the encoding in such a way that we can eliminate this overhead right so in databases uh, for those of you who are database 101 for those of you who might have forgotten the academic terms uh, there are different ways you can lay out data in a database so one way is called the nre storage module uh, the nsm which is the other colloquial term for this is uh, row wise storage okay the idea here is you take each row of your database or each tuple of your database and you are going to store one tuple at a time in when you store this data on disk right so looking at nsm or row wise storage on dna 
what we can do is PG Oligo Archive knows about the tuple boundaries. It knows exactly what a tuple is. It knows exactly you know, what the attributes are and what types of the attributes are. So what it does is it actually encodes each tuple as a separate DNA, okay? And it's going to synthesize each tuple as a separate DNA strand. What's the benefit of this is the fact that unlike unstructured data, unlike the fact that, you know, if you look at it as a binary stream, if you look at this data as a database, we know that each table has a primary key. Now, this is an assumption that we are making, right? And this is usually the case. If the table has a primary key, then you know that you're already ha you already have the information about how to uniquely identify your data. So we don't need to add any additional indexing information because when we read the data back, the indexing information is implicit in the primary key, right? So we can simply re read the data back and use the primary key to figure out whether the data is correct or whether it's wrong or whether it's a duplicate or not, right? So this is something that we can easily use to completely eliminate the indexing overhead. So we, out of the, uh, you know, out of the box, we get a 10 to 15% improvement in density just by being structure aware. What we can also do is what's called uh, the DSM layout, which is decomposition storage uh, method, or uh, in other colloquial terms, it's the columnar layout. So we can now splice out columns and we can actually store one uh, set of, you know, a group of columns per DNA as it's uh, shown here. Right. And we can exploit the fact that now we can use primary key foreign key relationships now, for instance, by repeating the primary key uh, in, in each set of columns, we can actually link them up together. The, these two uh, decomposed set of attributes, we can link them up together when we restore the data back. Right. So by doing this, what we again do is for, for records that don't fit in a single DNA, if you have a record that's too large, you can decompose it into separate records. You can use the primary key uh, to sort of index the records uh, before you write it out, and then you can store these records. And by doing this, what we show, what we actually show is that you can substantially improve uh, density even in this case if the record doesn't fit in a single uh, in a single oligo. Now, I have this is the prime basic idea of you know what you can get with structured data layout. But what we have also done is we have actually implemented uh, a customized uh, Huffman coding scheme that you can use for compressing the data. Uh, we, we have actually implemented dictionary compression so that you remove all the strings out and you pack each record as densely as possible to maximize the chance that a record can actually fit in a single oligo or in a few oligos. Okay? And PG Oligo Archive, the tool that we built, automatically does all of this for you. It figures out whether you should use NSM, whether you should use DSM, you know, what, uh, how should you compress the data. It deals with all of this and it provides structure-aware encoding of data. So that was PG Oligo Archive. Now let's look at the restoration part, PG Oligo Restore. The typical path for restoring data from DNA is shown here. So you have your DNA strands on the left. Then you first go through the sequencing procedure, which I described is the, the standard procedure that's used for reading data back from any DNA, including the human DNA. Out output of the sequencing is actually a set of strings, right? Those strings are fed to the clustering and reassembly step, where the idea is that you do not know what the original set of strings were. You have to discover it from what you got from the sequencer. So you cluster the strings and you reassemble the strings so that you get back your original set of strings. And then you decode the strings to get back the original binary string. So this is what people normally do when you actually look at uh, data as a binary string. You do not assume any kind of structure, right? Now, this clustering and reassembly step is a very, very time consuming step. Just to give you an idea, modern sequencers can produce, uh, they, they are capable of sequencing at, at very, very high depths. What I mean is each DNA strand can be read multiple times, 50 times, or you know, even 100 times, right? And when you get that, if you take a million DNA strands or a billion DNA strands potentially, and you multiply that by 100 sequencing depth, you are looking at you know, about 50 billion strings that you now have to cluster to discover the original set of strings. This is a massively computationally intensive problem, right? Because comparing strings, the algorithms that are used for comparing strings use a, some kind of a distance metric, like the edit distance. If for those of you who are not aware, this is a slight bit of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking an aside here, but uh, the algorithms themselves uh, rely on certain uh, computations uh, based on dynamic programming, 
which uh, which has very bad uh, complexity. Uh, uh, you know, the worst case time complexity of these algorithms is very high. It's n squared um, in many cases, and so this is not scalable at the set of strengths, right? What we can do, and what we do, is actually the fact that once again, PG Oligo Restore is trying to restore data back into a database. So we are not trying to restore binary data, which means we actually know that the data that we are going to generate has a specific structure. So what we are going to do is we are going to flip the clustering and reassembly and decoding, or rather we are going to merge it. So our procedure looks like this. We have original DNA, we feed it through sequencing, we get the set of strings back, and now instead of clustering, what we can do is we can kick off decoding. Okay, And when we decode, I told you that these strings have duplicates. These strings have errors right, uh, in the original data. The decoding is going to produce a set of tuples now. And now we know exactly what the structure of the tuple is. right? So we know that a tuple is supposed to have an integer followed by a float, followed by a date, followed by a string. And we can use the structure to very quickly remove all the tuples that do not match the structure and keep only the tuples that match the structure. And we can apply data cleaning algorithms that are very, very popular in the database community. It's been, we have had three decades of research on how do you clean a database which has errors. We can use data cleaning algorithms which are very scalable to recover back the original data. So we are, once again, we are using the schema information and the structure information to restore data back from the DNA. So we put all of this together. And what we actually did is we ran a simple experiment. We loaded a TPCH database into PostgreSQL. So TPCH is the industry standard uh, data warehousing benchmark. We loaded it into Postgres. And uh, the data size, the, the scale factor that we use is 10 to the minus 5. Uh, it, the size of the database is 12 kilobytes. I need to say that this was a sample experiment, and as you can imagine, the reason why we stuck to such small sizes was because it's incredibly expensive to synthesize DNA today. And this experiment was done before we started the project, so we didn't have funding yet. So we were limited to 12 kilobytes of data, and this was 36 records across eight tables. Okay? So we used PG Oligo Archive to generate the set of strings. Then we forwarded the strings to Twist Bioscience, who synthesized uh, the DNA for us. So we generated about 400 D DNA strands, single-stranded uh, DNA oligos, and each of which was 150 nucleotides long. Then we sequenced this DNA back with Illumina's uh, Nexec sequencing technology at very deep coverage. And PG Oligo Restore then performed automated restoration of the database. And we made sure we, we verified this, the end-to-end -end procedure of going from the relational database through the DNA back to the relational database, the entire cycle worked, and we showed that it's actually possible to archive data to a relational database. So, uh, sorry, from a relational database to DNA, I'm sorry. So, having talked about, about storing data on DNA, I'm now going to the next last few slides. I want to give you an overview of our work on near molecule query processing. So, as I told you, once you store data on DNA, it also becomes possible to run some computations that you traditionally run on a PC or on a server. It now becomes possible to run these in silico computations that you run on a silicon-based hardware, translate them into an in vitro computation that's done using a set of biochemical reactions or molecular biology, you know, using molecular biology techniques directly over data stored in DNA. Okay, so let's look. Uh, let's take a look at two of these uh, reactions that we showed that we could do and how we could offload some typical database operations to uh, into in vitro operations. The first one is if you look at database selection, a select query, right? So again, once again, you need to know the molecular biology 101. The, the technique that we use here is called polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase is an enzyme that's actually used for stitching up DNA. So if you give uh, the polymerase enzyme a single strand of DNA, and you throw in polymerase and you throw in some uh, you know free nucleotides the polymerase will actually generate the complementary strand of dna for you okay so what polymerase chain reaction can do is it can amplify your dna it can generate multiple copies of a single dna strand or an oligo multiple copies of it very very quickly so within a few reactions the the number of uh, copies grows exponentially what you need to know for running an effective PCR is you need to know the starting and ending sequences. So these are called, typically referred to as primers in molecular biology. 
So basically, if you know the start and ending sequences, you can tell the polymerase enzyme to go and look at a DNA strand, an oligo that has these sequences and go and amplify it. And then the PCR uh, and the, the polymerase would then go bind itself to the DNA with these particular starting and ending points and amplify them to generate you know, double-stranded DNA. You can heat the double-stranded DNA to separate out the DNA strands, run PCR again. So you go from one DNA strand to two, to four, to eight, very, very quickly, it grows uh, you know, rapidly. And you can get multiple copies of DNA. Now, what you can do is actually use this very technique for running a select query on data stored in DNA. So I'm giving you an example where you want to do a select star from a table, meaning you, you have stored your database in DNA and you want to retrieve only one table from your database, right? So what you can do is you can actually store the, uh, the primers that I told you about, the starting and ending sequences. You can use unique sequences for different tables. And by doing this, you can actually transform a select query into a polymerase chain reaction where you say, tell the polymerase, I want all the DNA strands which have this specific starting and ending sequences that corresponds to my table. And polymerase and PCR would then amplify just those DNA strands. And what would happen is effectively, you end up doing a selection in vitro directly on data stored in DNA. So you don't have to get all the data out and then you know, filter through the data to do the selection. You can simply do the selection directly in DNA. And this could potentially, as you can imagine, you can easily extend it to project columns, right? If I encode each column with these unique uh, primers, unique IDs, then I can pull out columns from a table. Or if you, you, if you encode tuples with unique values uh, for a particular attribute, then you can do a select on a specific tuple, although that gets a bit more uh, uh, complicated scalability from a scalability point of view, because, you know, it, it depends on how many sets of values you have and how many primers you can generate. Okay, but without going into details, the idea is you can transform a selection that runs on uh, your CPU into a PCR reaction that actually runs directly over DNA. So how about a join? It turns out you can also do something like this with joins. So the molecular biology 101 that you need to know here is about the complementarity complementarity of the matching base pairs. So in naturally occurring DNA, in the double-stranded DNA, for those of you who remember your biology, the, the two strands are actually made up of complementary nucleotides, right? So together, these are called base pairs. So an A nucleotide on one strand, which is attached to your, your sugar phosphate backbone, actually binds to the T nucleotide on the other strand, and a G on one strand binds to the C on the other strand. So the idea uh, of... Um, using this complementarity comes from this technique called annealing, where if you take two DNA strands which have complementary end sequences, end points, as it's shown here in the first figure, and if you bring them together with the right conditions and with the right enzymes, you can actually stitch the two DNA strands together, okay, to produce, to convert these two DNA strands into a single DNA strand. So this process is called annealing, and it's kind of effectively attaching these two DNA strands together or two, DNA, two, two oligos together to produce a single oligo, right? So the only requirement is that there should be an overhang on either ends of the oligo, which have these kind of complementary matching nucleotides or matching base pairs that you can bring them together and you can anneal them. So how do we do this for, use this for a join? Turns out it's fairly, uh, you know, as you would expect, it's actually, fairly a straightforward mapping again, right? So as before, we stored the data in, in DNA form. So you have on either ends, you have these unique IDs or unique primers as before. But instead of generating one DNA strand, what we make sure is the, we make sure that the, the additional DNA strand that we want to join. So if you have one table, uh, table A and table B that you want to join, you make sure that the complementary uh, tuples that need to be joined they actually use complementary uh, nucleotides for these particular endpoints. So what the figure shows here nicely uh, is the fact that the first uh, uh, oligo shown on the top could be a tuple from one table. The second oligo shown on the top is a tuple from another table. Now, these two tuples are linked by a foreign key primary key relationship. And this relationship, for instance, is actually exemplified. It's You can clearly see that in the DNA, we represent this relationship by using these complementary sequences, right? So you, on one tuple, you have ATT. On the other tuple, you have TAA. 
this creates a nice overhang and when you bring these two tuples together and when you actually use the right set of uh, you know the, under the right conditions under the right uh, uh, with the right enzymes these two tuples will come together they will anneal to each other and uh, you can then use pcr to amplify just uh, you know uh, this anneal tuples based on the first and the last ids and you can extract the data out so this is how you could actually do a join now as before we actually did a, a simple experiment to actually show that join works we took two tables so the data stored in the dna we took a table a part table and a part sub table from tpch we took two uh, records from these tables and we encoded them in such a way that they had these complementary overhangs and we actually then did a join by doing this annealing uh, experiment and what's shown here is the uh, a small figure from gel electrophoresis this is a, a you know it's a, it's a technique for confirming for checking the length of dna strand that gets generated and without going into details what you need to understand what what, what the figure is showing you is the fact that uh, the join actually did happen and we can actually see that the newly generated oligo the newly generated dna is a fused one which takes one dna from the first table one dna from the second table and it anneals them together okay so that's kind of the experiment that we did to show that both selection and joins and projections are actually possible in dna so after this long talk just to summarize uh, all contemporary media types suffer from obsolescence so this is a problem that's affecting the hollywood archives and it's affecting many other archives uh, right now and all media types have limited durability limited lifetime and they have a very high crisis rate meaning there will always be a need to migrate from one generation to another dna provides a fantastic biological alternatives uh, to the to these media devices it's very dense and it's very durable and we also showed that you could potentially use it as a computational substrate and techniques like pcr which allow you to create multiple copies exponentially make it very scalable as a computational substrate so dna and dbms we think we share they share a symbiotic relationship so we think that dna can act as a a zeta scale archive uh, that can support near data near molecule processing and we can use knowledge about dbms the structured knowledge about dbms to optimize the read write path and uh, you know to to sort of drive density improvements in dna so that's my talk and uh, uh, you know i'll just uh, tell you throw more one more thing before i actually tell you we are working on several exciting topics related to data archival and preservation uh, once again this is in the context of the both in the context of the project oligo archive and uh, in collaboration with uh, my colleague uh, dr thomas hines from imperial college and a few others here uh, we have we are looking at combining different kinds of storage devices like optical storage and dna for long term archival we are looking at uh, database preservation so how would you rethink emulation and migration for you know databases if you have dna as a backend medium we are also looking at using more conventional projects like using magnetic tape in combination with the cloud um, so get in touch with me or get in touch with anybody from the oligo archive project and we would be very very happy to uh, collaborate with you guys on any of these topics or for proof of concept implementations uh, where you can archive data to dna or so forth thank you very much and this is the stop codon that actually tells uh, you know in in biology if you don't know what a stop codon is i ask you to uh, i suggest you know you go and look it up it's a, it's a very interesting um a thought process it's a very interesting exercise to see the parallels between how we encode data digitally and how biologically you know uh, dna encodes the genetic information thank you oh thank you very much i'm still like you know having this wow effect <laughs> <laughs> like you know those joints like on molecular level are like totally uh, wow but uh, if i can ask like uh, we've got some questions in the chat uh, like uh, if uh, is it like now like purely theoretical or uh, do you have any like deployment so real world deployment uh, I think I actually like lost you a little bit in the middle. So you were asking just to make sure you were asking whether the the joints or whether this whole thing is purely the computational part. Is it purely theoretical or do we have no, real world no, no, deployment? No, no. I'm like uh, asking about the storage part. Like, uh, it, do you have any like real deployments or it's like in the phase where it's purely theoretical? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so we don't we don't have any real deployments at this point. Uh, part of the reason, of course, is because this is very nascent technology, and uh, you know there are many things to be worked out in DNA storage. Uh, particularly, one of the biggest things is the fact that uh, synthesizing or manufacturing DNA is extremely expensive today. So uh, while this 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 research is sort of um, you know trying to sort of pave the way let's say five or 10 years down the line so that, you know, when DNA storage becomes, when synthesis becomes cheaper, we are already ready for, you know, migrating our existing infrastructure over to DNA, right? Okay, that that was my second question about the cost, actually. So that could probably you have like uh, answered me. So I think like it's in the millions or more like in thousands. Uh, yes, it, it's, uh, I mean, you know, the, just to put it in perspective, I can say like uh, in broad numbers, it's like about five orders or six orders of magnitude more expensive than tape. So it's it's okay. very very expensive. So uh, just synthesizing the few kilobytes of data, it actually costs us in a few thousands, right? So wow. if you're looking at megabytes, you're going into millions, definitely. Okay, <laughs> okay. So like uh, another question, actually, I was interested in, like uh, because you said that uh, that is a single strand, not a double one. So it has any consequences in the durability of this DNA? Uh, no, no, not not at all. So this. Uh, when we manufacture the DNA, we sorry, when we encode the data on the DNA, we make sure that, uh, you know, uh, the strands are actually uh, orthogonal to each other so that there are no secondary reactions. There are no uh, problems when you store all these strands together. Um, uh, there is no particular uh, limitation with respect to durability of the, because okay. of the fact that it's a strand. Okay, and so I like another question, like I was interested why like you use vacuum Maybe uh, because I've heard about like solutions to use like noble gases, like to keep, you know, DNA uh, in the tube. So, yes, so this, better, but... actually, yes, you, you are absolutely right. So I, I think I, uh, so there's a couple of different uh, approaches here, but I think the one that uh, I will have to recheck, but the, you're probably right in the sense that the company that I was talking about, they do use inert gases, I think. So it's not okay. necessarily vacuum, yes. Okay, okay, that, that was that's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, there is another question in the chat. Have you tested with Bytea fields? <laughs> uh, no, not particularly. No. So any kind of uh, uh, you know problematic fields, we actually left it out for the initial implementation. So uh, Varkar, for example, is one of those uh, nasty fields which always creates a, a variable in characters. For example, in the implementation, uh, we had to be very careful in how we actually encode these fields. So what we had is, uh, yeah, and, and of course, we also did not uh, specifically look at uh, things like, for example, uh, there is an option for you to store a binary blob, um, you know, and point to it from Postgres. We did not look at binary blobs specifically. So there's a lot of things that we need to still look at. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Okay, probably, okay, <laughs> just, you know, congratulations and that, that was a great session. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, so maybe the, the last one from me, just to not keep you too long. Uh, like, is it like your algorithm are like the open source or they are like uh, your IP? Uh, no, so everything we build is, is open source. Um, right now, we are we are working on optimizing and improving this uh, encoding. Uh, you know, the, yeah, the encoding scheme that we use in the you know PG Oligo archive, mm -hmm. and we are also looking at some uh, you know some new interesting um, you know techniques for optimizing the clustering performance, as I told you, which is in PG Oligo Restore. That's the reason why we haven't entirely like you know thrown open everything uh, at this point. But uh, we already the initial versions of these device tools which we built, uh, they are already out so uh, out in the open. So and we actually built it based on essentially like you know we we followed the the very first step that we did was using PG dump and then starting from that point because you know our oligo the, the two were separated right. Then we came up with a new one. But anyway. Okay. 